Uh, welcome back to our uh, lectures, and this will be our last lecture on the New Testament writings um, as we look at the Johannine epistles and the revelation of John. So those are the letters that John wrote, as well as uh, what we in our English Bible have as the revelation of John, the last book of the New Testament, last book of the Bible. Let me encourage you to continue to uh, keep up with your daily work, and I want to once again remind you that on week eight, the final week of the course, all of your coursework is due that Friday, except for the final exam. So just remember everything that needs to be turned in, specifically um, your, your project, writing your storyline. And uh, I'm going to produce another video that talks about um, that final project, as well as does a quick review for the final exam. So uh, all of those things, except the final exam, are due by that Friday so that I can have the weekend to grade and get the grades back to you um, early the following week. So just would encourage you to keep up with your current work as well as um, get, all, get all the stuff done by Friday of week eight. And uh, that's the date on that Friday is uh, February 26th. And so we just encourage you with that. And uh, as always, if there's any way that I can help you, uh, I would be glad to do that. So don't hesitate to contact me. So let's look at uh, John's letters and the revelation of John uh, in this time that we have together right now. Um, introductory material, uh, the author is uh, John, uh, John the Elder, as he's known, um, the same as the author of the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation. Um, the date is probably during uh, the late first century. However, this is still um, debated by, um, uh, by scholars today. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we look at the different views uh, or different viewpoints in approaching uh, interpretation in regards to the book of Revelation and the importance of the date. Um, and the purpose was to give assurance of salvation. Um, the, uh, this specifically, the date issue is going to deal with the book of Revelation, but this specifically in the letters of John were to give the early believers an assurance of their salvation, as well as a warning against false teachers, and to admonish them and exhort them to godly um, behavior. And so uh, it's important that we see some of the distinctions in the letters of John, especially in regards to the general epistles. The general epistles, um, so basically you have uh, the letters from Paul, the Pauline epistles. You have these letters from John, the Johannine epistles. And then um, the rest of the letters that were written are known as the general epistles. So um, the, the letter of James, the letter to the Hebrews, First and Second Peter, and Jude, those are known as the general um, epistles. And um, so with John's letters, though, the key uh, impact here is this idea of an assurance of salvation, uh, especially in 1 John. In 1 John, he deals um, with this aspect of assurance um, multiple times. Um, the key themes, as we just emphasized, the assurance of salvation John repeatedly uh, uses the phrase, that you may know. And so he wants to be certain that his readers know in regards to their relationship and faith in Jesus Christ. And in warning against the false teachers, John not only identifies false teaching, but gives signs of their behavior so that people would be able to recognize them as well. In 1 John 4, he talks about testing the spirits and the test for these spirits, these aspects of false teaching is in regards to the reality of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And of course, that's uh, key theologically for the New Testament and for what we understand as Christ coming in the flesh, being God in human flesh. And so that's a key test in 1 John chapter 4. And then the exhortation to godly living, especially the reiteration and the ways that he talks about our love for one another, uh, which is really a follow-up from that emphasis in the Gospel of John, John chapter 13, when Jesus told his original disciples that the world will know you are mine 
by your love for one another. So this is a key that, that John wanted to get across uh, to the early believers. Uh, in 1 John, and I've just realized, let me get my talking head out of the way here. In uh, 1 John, we see, uh, as we outline through the book, we see the prologue, the opening. Um, we see, see these assurances uh, through and the exhortation in regards to our fellowship with one another and, and how that's an indicator in regards to our love for one another, as well as our assurance that we know Christ. Uh, we see in chapter 2 the warnings about the false teachers, and uh, in chapter uh, last part of chapter 2 through chapter, early chapter 3, the exhortation to godly living based on, just like in the general epistles and in Paul's, uh, some of Paul's letters, and uh, Peter specifically, that our life lived in Christ is based on his second coming, that life of hope and joy and forgiveness and all that we have here in advance of and living towards his second coming. And then in chapter 3, the assurance that we have through our love, through not only the love of God given to us, but our love for one another, and uh, the warnings against false teachers, 1 John 4, 1 through 6. That's what I mentioned just a moment ago about testing the spirits in regards to um, how they line up with Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And of course, that's, uh, that's an important aspect of our New Testament understanding. And then the exhortation to love because God has first loved us. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And uh, in chapter four talks about that aspect of God loving us first. And so as a result of our knowledge of God, we can love one another and that God's perfect love is that which casts out fear. There's no reason for us to be afraid to love other people because we know that perfect love of God through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, then he continues in the exhortation to love our assurance uh, in Christ's presence before God and then keeping ourselves from idols. So that's the outline of uh, 1 John, uh, which has five chapters. 2 John and 3 John just have a, uh, are just, again, short books, one chapter. And uh, in 2 and 3 John, um, there's something that, that seems to be not only in this exhortation to love and know truth, and in 3 John, this warning against false teachers, but in regards to this assurance of salvation that's spelled out in 1 John, in 2 John and in 3 John really seems to be real life applications, real life applications of the salvation that we have in Christ. And so that's really the, the emphasis in 2 John and in 3 John. And, and, and that's what you need to know and understand in regards to those two letters as a, as a follow up in the real life application, living out this salvation um, experience that we have because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so uh, those are keys there in regards to the outlines uh, of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then as we move on to the revelation of John, uh, this is a very unique uh, portion of scripture. It's unique in a number of ways in its time and in its setting as well as in its uh, application to us today. And we've talked a bit about literature when we were talking about uh, some of the Old Testament books more specifically, uh, but it's written in that genre of literature known as um, apocalyptic. And so um, we need to make certain that the ways that we interpret or the view that we take in regards to the, the revelation of John uh, plays into our understanding of it. So um, I want to touch on the four major views that people um, seem to express across the board in evangelical Christianity today in regards to um, the approach that they take in interpreting the book of Revelation. And this is, this is key, this is vital, because the approach that one takes is how they're going to bring application and draw from this apocalyptic type literature this highly symbolic writing um, that's expressing to us um, uh, end times. And uh, so first is the historicism or the historical view. Um, and the historicism uh, sees the book of Revelation as a chronological record of historical events from the New Testament church until the return of Christ 
who will then, when upon Christ's return, will create a new heaven and a new earth. And that's basically the events of chapters four through twenty. Um, and most of us, in, most of what has happened has happened in the past for those of us who are living in the 21st century. So we see it as that picture and we're drawing towards the end of uh, that section and that understanding. And, and uh, what's important is these first three chapters in the book of John deal specifically with uh, local churches that we're aware of, or at least that's the way uh, different portions of it are addressed specifically. But uh, the historicist people, they, they then from chapter four moving forward, um, see us moving towards this new heaven and new earth and with most of what's recorded then in those chapters having already been accomplished um, they they see uh, you know they see the time of Christ's return very near uh, now there's a footnote down there at the bottom most of these folks hold to a post millennialism and that's the fact that Jesus will return after a thousand years you if you know the word millennial um, or millennium it stands for a thousand and post would be Jesus returning after that the prefix there after that thousand years um, in which the dragon is bound in the gospel triumphs and um, some of these folks in this camp and believe me in these four major approaches that we're going to talk about there's still a range a pretty wide range in some of them of folks who would hold on to these in general but would play out their interpretation of the book of Revelation uh, with, with vastly different specifics. And so this isn't a theology class or an interpretation class. Um, it's just an overview class. So I want to give you this overview so that when you take uh, further classes, um, you'll have this at least this general understanding and this uh, definition for the sake of background as you uh, further your academic career and understanding of the scriptures. So some of these folks would believe that we'll, we're in this thousand years now, or there's some within this group that would think the thousand years is still to come. So um, that's the historical view. Um, the, the second major approach is the futuristic view or futurism that Revelation reflects not only real historical events, but the fact that these historical events are mostly in the future for us. So they would see chapters 4 through 20, which remember the first three chapters deal with um, messages to specific churches. They would see chapters 4 through 20 as really being um, what's going to happen coming, what, what it is that's to come before Christ returns. And um, these folks would include a, um, a seven-year tribulation period, and that's how they would break down chapters 6 through 19. And then a millennial period, um, as mentioned there in the first part of uh, chapter 20. And in that time frame, Christ would rule on the earth prior to the new heaven and new earth coming about. Now, this group, as we footnoted on the first group, being post-millennialists, this group would be pre-millennialists pre-millennialist. So with that idea of being a millennialist is that thousand year reign of Christ, post being after, the prefix meaning after, pre, obviously as you would have figured out by now, meaning they see um, Christ returning before that thousand year reign. And again, within this camp, there's still some variance. And in that return of Christ physically to earth, um, it would happen either before or after the tribulation period, but would still be prior to the millennial uh, thousand year reign uh, here on earth. And so um, again, that's the futuristic view and, and we're not gonna take the time to get into all of these. And, and each one of these has uh, questions and pondering all of its own, uh, but this is just an overview class. And so use these uh, use this information and these definitions to help you as you move forward in your own study. And then third, the preterist view. Um, preterism believes that um, Revelation is primarily dealing with things that happened um, in the distant past and in the early years of the church. And um, most preterists see basically everything happening prior to the final judgments uh, there at the very end of the book of Revelation. 
uh, taking place uh, really within the close of the first century. And this is where that aspect of dating that I mentioned earlier uh, takes place. And so um, some would see the book of Revelation being written much earlier in the uh, first century and a lot of traditionalists have the book of Revelation being written late in the first century. And so you can see to be writing about things that had already happened um, or to be writing about something that was predicted would all hinge on where you or when you believe the book of Revelation was recorded. And so the preterist view is primarily about things that happened, um, again, in the distant past and in the early years of the church and um, describing that immediate uh, persecution that, that began uh, before the close of the first century. And then there's the idealism or spiritualism, uh, spiritualistic aspect, which agrees um, primarily with the historical view um, that Revelation is about the conflict between Christ and the church and Satan and the forces of evil um, that will take place from the church until the return of Christ. But they believe Revelation is uh, symbolic and can be applied to both events that happened in the immediate present of the early church and what they were suffering and going through in regards to their uh, time of persecution, but also it can be applicable for um, not only the original readers, but for those of us and all who have lived until Christ uh, returns. And so they really see it um, almost completely symbolic and in that way making it applicable to those from the first century and all of Christians through the church age who have lived even until today. And the footnote here is um, the uh, the idea of holding to an amillennial view. Now, if you remember, millennialism being that thousand-year reign of Christ, post being after pre, meaning before, a is the prefix meaning not or none. And so Christ will return after the millennium, um, but generally holds that Revelation speaks in symbolism so that it would not necessarily have to account for a literal thousand-year uh, reign, and that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was when Satan was bound, um, which we see mentioned in the book of Revelation. So uh, again, just putting these out there so that you can have an idea as future study and future conversation comes about, just some basic knowledge and basic definition. And again, let me emphasize in all of these views, there's, um, th there's still within each camp a wide range of uh, where they would settle in regards to the um, specifics and detailed application today. And so um, that kind of sets the stage in regards to, um, because as I mentioned earlier, how you approach the book of Revelation is going to determine how you uh, interpret the book of Revelation. So uh, in interpreting Revelation, there's some key passages. Um, at the very beginning of the book, the thing, the key passages um, mentioned here are both found in Revelation chapter 1 because you see two different aspects um, that would fall into play with the approach that someone would take. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, 1 says the things that must soon take place. So what would that mean to those original recipients? Uh, but also in verse 19 of chapter 1, the things that were and are and will come. Uh, and and how you tie that into your understanding of interpreting the book of Revelation. So we see a really almost specific time frame, but then almost an open-ended time frame, uh, even mentioned at the very beginning of the book in chapter 1. Um, we also see a lot of Old Testament symbolism in regards to uh, the book of Revelation. And um, just let me look here and, and read, if you would, from Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through uh, 16, we see, excuse me, I thought I had it right marked on that page. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, I turned and uh, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe. 
and um, he uses this symbolism of the sevens that he saw. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he has laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And so we see symbolism expressed uh, throughout uh, the book of Revelation as it is apocalyptic literature, and it ties in with some of the Old Testament symbolism there as well. Um, key themes, and this is important, no matter how you would choose to interpret the book of Revelation, some key themes. Uh, first and foremost, that Jesus is present in his church. We already mentioned that the first three chapters deal with specific messages to the churches, and um, that through the Holy Spirit, Christ knows the trials and the triumphs and the failures that, that the church faces. And then secondly, world history, every bit of it. And this is so important to understand that God is sovereign. God is ruler over all, that every bit of world history is firmly under the control of Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God. And then third, that Satan attacks the church through persecution, false teaching, affluence, and sensual pleasure. And all of these are warnings that are given. And again, in spite of how you might interpret the book of Revelation, these are lessons we can draw from in application to our lives today. And then fourth, Jesus will ultimately defeat all of his enemies and all that's tainted by sin and suffering, um, yet not redeemed by the Lamb. And all those things will be, all of, all of the sin and its impact be destroyed and done away with while all things uh, will be made new. And that culmination of this new creation, as we saw the emphasis in Robert's book tying all the way back to the original creation, this idea of the new creation. Um, is going to be the church presented to Jesus Christ as a bride. And so it's important that we see that, especially in those last couple of chapters, uh, last few chapters of the book of Revelation. So key themes that, in my opinion, are extremely encouraging and um, really grant us that hope and that joy that, yes, we're going through difficult times, and, and yes, we'll face the opposition of the enemy, that Christ is already victorious, and he's allowing all of world's history in which he controls to play into the finality of all that's going to ultimately glorify him. Uh, the general outline here of the book, the introduction, which we've mentioned already, um, the glorified Christ, uh, the fact that Christ has already been glorified by his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of the Father. And then the seven letters to the seven churches. We've mentioned that a couple of times already, um, that uh, specifically these messages to these churches. And um, there were key elements in all of these messages, and that is the description of Christ, their com a commendation to them, a rebuke, an exhortation, and a promise. And you can see that in each of the different sections of uh, chapters two and three in the messages to the specific churches. Fourth, uh, there's a picture of the throne in heaven, and uh, that always thrills my heart when I think of the opportunity that when we are singing praises here on this earth, when we worship God here, we're doing and we're involved in an activity that takes place around God's throne all the time. And what a connection we have to the eternal, even though we're here in this temporary place. Um, that, that we can connect with the praise that's being offered to God, which is taking place around his throne all the time. And then we see the scroll and the lamb, the seals, the trumpet judgments. Um, there's an interlude that talks about heavenly warfare. Um, and then there's the bowl judgments. And um, in regards to these seals and trumpet judgments and bowl judgments, um, it's important that you understand the aspect that in each of these judgments, they intensify, they get more and more serious, they get more and more intense in what's taking place through these judgments. And so um, you need to remember that uh, specifically for your quiz, um, but uh, this idea of the intensity that continues to amp up and uh, build going through the book of Revelation. And then the destruction of Babylon. And uh, here the harlot of Babylon is clearly laid out 
as one that is in direct opposition to God, direct opposition to God's character, God's holiness, God's purity, and um, really is that ultimate representation of depravity, which is in complete opposition to the very character and what we know of God Almighty. And um, then we see, as the book is coming to a close, events surrounding the return of Christ. And again, your application of these is going to depend on your interpretation or the approach in which you come to uh, the book of Revelation. And then finally, the millennium, that thousand-year reign that we uh, that we mentioned earlier in talking about the different views of interpreting the book of Revelation. And there is a final judgment. And, um, you know, even the book of Hebrews tells us that that it's appointed once for a man to die and then the final judgment or the judgment face the judgment seat of God. And of course, we know that in Christ, that judgment of God's wrath against our sin has already been taken care of, uh, paid for by Christ's death on the cross. And so this final judgment is not something to be feared by those who know Christ. And yet at the same time, it should be even more of a motivation for us out of our love for Christ and what he's done for us to make certain that we share that love of the gospel with others so that they know uh, what Christ uh, has accomplished on the cross. And then the consummation and uh, the finality uh, that's mentioned there in the book of Revelation. And, and even as we saw in, I believe it was our first week of Robert's study questions in the original creation, he had you read a passage from Revelation 21 tying into both what we have at the very beginning of the Bible in regards to creation and the, 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 the tree and the river and those descriptions uh, from the book of Genesis that, that uh, bring the Bible back to God's original desire and plan is for us to live in what he intends and has created for us so that we would know him. And so uh, that covers the, the, in a very general way, the book of Revelation and the letters of John. And again, I would just encourage you to keep up with your uh, work. Um, week eight assignments are all due on that Friday, except for the final exam. And uh, your project is coming up. So look for a video that talks about your final project, as well as does a quick review over the um, final exam. And the majority of the final exam is taken from previous quizzes. So in preparation for the final exam, uh, you'll get a, a good bit of it accomplished if you'll um, review your quizzes uh, that you've had each week up to this point. Again, I am here for you. If there's any way I can encourage you or help you in any way, please don't hesitate to contact me. And I trust God's blessings upon you.